Hello, hello. Let me do a sound check here. Thank you for waiting patiently for me to log in here. Let's do a quick sound check. All right. I see everybody get logging into the chat already. It's gonna be a <laughs> it's gonna be a doozy. You guys are gonna have a lot of fun with me tonight. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy evening and uh hanging out. Let me just check my audio. Audio is checking good. I see the sound is great. All right. What's up, Jilliana Marie? You caught me live. What's happening? All right. <laughs> What's good, though? <laughs> Fifth Dimension, Sean. All right. What's the title? What did Jesus? Did Jesus kill who? <laughs> the title of this is Did Jesus Kill His Brother and Have Sex with His Sister? Now, this is going to be an interesting topic. Obviously, there's a slight twist to this that I'm going to educate you on some knowledge and some wisdom here. And hopefully, as I get into my talk tonight, um, you listen with open ears and open heart and open mind. And then when I get done with this talk, that you don't just sit back and uh, kick your feet up, that you actually go and do some of your own research, that you dig a little bit deeper and find out what's really going on in the ancient past. You know, people always ask me, like, why do you focus on the ancient past so much? Why are you always talking about the past and looking into ancient history and traveling to these ancient sites? What is the purpose? If you understand that everything happens in cycles of time, what this called cyclical cycles, and what's happened before actually happens again over and over and over. Just like if you're watching a Hollywood movie where you see they have they have people in this time loop and they can't get out of this stupid loop and they have to relive it over and over again. I think Tom Cruise had a famous movie where he was in one of those time loops. He had to go through it thousands and thousands of times before he gained mastery over the situation. <clears throat> thousands of deaths he died going through that same loop until he could remember the past, until he understood the past, until he, until he could discern every move that his opponents were going to make, then and only then was he able to crack the code and get out of the loop, right? <clears throat> Edge of Tomorrow was the name of that uh, movie, I believe. If you haven't seen Edge of Tomorrow, check it out. And so if you don't understand the past, the past is prologue, meaning what happened then is going to happen again, and it's going to keep happening. So until we learn the lessons of the past, we're never going to have a bright future, period, period. You can't just say, forget everything that happened. Let's start from now. You can't, because if that was the case, a kid wouldn't have to grow up to become an adult. A kid would be an adult at birth because a kid would never make any mistakes and would never do anything wrong. A kid would never screw up at all. You come out of the womb, boom, you're ready to go to work. You're a full grown adult. You should be able to know how to, know how to talk, how to walk how to ride a bike, how to drive a car, whatever, right? Because, hey, the past doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? The past does matter because it's only by the past that we actually create our own future. It's learning from the lessons of the past. If I'm a baby learning how to walk and I crawl up to the edge of a couch or a little table and I try to get my balance and take that first step and fall on my face, that is now in the past. But if it wasn't for that first step, my brain would not be able to calculate the adjustment needed to take the next step and the next step. You see what I'm saying? The past does matter. It matters a lot. It matters more than anything. Without the past, we don't have a future. Without learning from the past, I should say, we don't have a future. That's how important it is. All right. So it's all about understanding what really happened, how, what, where, why, when. And how does that directly affect us today? And then how does the knowledge of that change the way we move forward in the future? Not only us, but future generations of us. And right now, we are stuck in a religious debacle on this planet. We are in a situation on this planet where religion has dominated the planet in, a, in such a way that it has literally um, put chains on the minds of Million of uh, billions of billions of people because 85% of the world is religious. 85% of the world out of 8 billion people, 85% are religious. It has put a chain 
on our brains, literally locking us. People are saying, you know, is this a prison planet? Well, just because of simply because of religion alone, I would have to say yes. It has locked us in this repeatable cycle of mental enslavement for eons. And it's time to break that. And that's why I'm here. So today we're going to talk about Yeshua, a.k.a. Jesus. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the image of Jesus and who the image is. And also I'm going to talk to you, did, did this person actually exist? And if this person did exist, what was the reason? What was the purpose? So we're going to dig in today. All right. You guys ready? All right. We're going to go into a little bit of a PowerPoint here because, you know, I like to bring the facts. I like to bring my receipts. I like to, <laughs> I like to bring my receipts with me, as they say, as the young generation says. You know why? Because when you don't bring the receipts, people think you're just talking off the top of your head. So I bring the receipts with me. I bring the receipts. All right. So I'm going to share my screen, guys, and we're going to get right into this mini workshop. All right. Let's see, share my audio system too, just in case I play an audio file. And uh, let's go ahead and start this slideshow. Topic of today, did Jesus murder his brother and have sex with his sister? That's pretty potent. That's a potent uh, subject line. <laughs> it's a question mark, though. It's a question mark. OK, I'm asking a question and I'm going to present some evidence to you today that's going to show you who is the person portraying to be what we consider to be the modern day Jesus in modern society. And I'm going to trace back some of the uh, the Jewish roots and we're going to find out a little bit more history there as to where a lot of these things come from and who um, who's controlling the narrative, so to say, so to speak. Right. Before I do that, I always got to get my shameless plugs out of the way. I like to get them out of the way in the beginning because people are still loading into the chat. People are still loading up and getting the text messages I sent out for alerts. Of course, you can get my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tab. It's still a bestseller right now. Woke doesn't mean broke. Financial literacy book, still a bestseller. Also in five uh, four countries. Woke doesn't mean broke. Four countries. Compendium of the Emerald Tab. It's bestseller in five countries. You can get three days free on Forbidden Knowledge TV. Don't forget, we just released the Black Knight Satellite movie. It's an amazing documentary. You don't want to miss it. Thousands of people have given it five-star reviews already. You have to go watch it on Forbidden Knowledge TV. You might as well watch it. You can watch it for free, 4BK.TV, or you can go on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, the iOS app, the Google Play Store, or the web, or you can scan this QR code, QR code as well. Don't forget about my social media app, Unite the 99. We're on our way to a million members in there. Soon we'll have a million members on Unite the 99. That's our own social media app. No algorithms, no AI that's conscious like the one on Google. None of this craziness, right? Uh, a good social media app that lets you post images and videos and stories and swipes. You can go live if you're a verified account. Uh, for right now, I'm only doing verified accounts can go live, but eventually everyone will be able to go live when I get a couple more admins to watch out for craziness. However, this app is incredible and you can post what you want, talk about things that you like to talk about and your post will show up in order, not an algorithm order, but a real per post order. We were raising funds for forbidden knowledge. We are, we already announced that we're going to be going public. Uh, and that's going to be we're reaching for NASDAQ in the first quarter of 2023. So if you are an investor in Forbidden Knowledge, congratulations. That was a shareholder QR code that we had up. And also, don't forget free workshops. I have a workshop coming up this Sunday on Juneteenth. So on Juneteenth, I'm doing a very special workshop and it's going to be the, uh, the top 20 inventions by black people because Juneteenth is the original Independence Day for black people in America, if you didn't know. So when Independence Day happened, black people were still slaves. That's why I don't celebrate Independence Day. Independence Day means absolutely diddly squat to me. It means zero, it means nothing. Because for over another hundred years, uh, blacks were still slaves in America and still run by slave owners. 
uh, true independence or the beginning, not even true, but the beginning of independence began on Juneteenth. And still, even after that, some people were still slaves up to 50 years later. But we do celebrate Juneteenth. So I'll be doing a very special live event on Forbidden Knowledge TV. You can register on eventbrite.com. It doesn't cost any money. You just have to be a subscriber to Forbidden Knowledge TV. So if you don't have it, take your three day free trial now so that you can watch the actual live event. All right. If you want to get to access access to all my free workshops, here's the QR code. Make sure you scan it and get access to all of my free workshops. Not only the ones I have coming up, but all the workshops I did in the past. Thousands of dollars in workshops are now available on Forbidden Knowledge TV. And if you want to be uh, able to be entered into our giveaway this, this month, last month we gave away Apple TV. This month we're giving away an iMac. Oh, no, I'm sorry, a MacBook Pro. We're giving away a MacBook Pro this month. Text hashtag giveaway to 954-245-0086. That's hashtag giveaway to 954-245-0086. And don't forget the Black Knight Satellite documentary just got released. You know, you're dealing with all of these objects that are hanging out over your sensitive military installations, nuclear facilities, and now you're seeing objects in orbit? After I enhanced it a little bit more, I can see that there was almost two halves to this craft. This is something that is intelligently made. Somebody is watching us. We should at least know who it is and why. The watch we call the messenger. Yes. They keep watching us because they're thinking, well, perhaps they're not going in the right direction. This is an actual NSA document. They are talking about communication through specific frequencies and then how we can communicate back with ET. This black knight is somehow correlated with the Baltus constellation. I think there's a lot more to it. An early reptilian race brought this satellite yep. into orbit. These so-called satellites are to observe the planets, to listen. The universe is full of these probes. What I think is the most important thing to understand, are we being watched? Who is watching us? And where are they from? I am Billy Carson, and this is my investigation into the Black Knight satellite. Black Knight. Black Knight. Okay, so that's the Black Knight satellite. satellite. Let me go on to the next. We do have a hot song out, by the way, with that. The Black Knight satellite soundtrack is out and available. Okay, let's get into it, guys. False images of the Christ. So here in this image you see on the left, you see Caesar Borgia. Caesar Borgia, however you want to pronounce it. And on the right, you see what's been known as the depiction of Jesus Christ, which is now a global image. <clears throat> I'm going to teach you of the falsehoods of this image, and I'm going to go kind of deep into it as well. So false images of Jesus. The Renaissance depiction of Christ as a handsome, thin-faced white man with a thin beard is based on the likeness of Cesare Borgia and the second son of Rodrigo Borgia, a.k.a. Pope Alexander VI. Okay, this is getting into the papacy. Now, this is actually uh, right at the era. This is the era of the beginning of the papal inquisitions, by the way. Which, in which they, the popes ordered the death of over 80 million people over the course of 700 years to get them to believe in their religion and Jesus. Cesare Borgia was born in 1475 and became a cardinal in the Catholic Church at the age of 18. This is the, this is the guy that you're praying to. So when you are a Christian person and you believe in the, uh, in the uh, biblical Jesus, and you're calling on the name of Jesus and believing in Jesus and everything else. And you're looking at that image of Jesus in your church and you're dropping onto your knees and crying and weeping all your tears. This is the guy that you're actually praying to and crying to. Not the real person at all. Let me tell you how brutal this guy was. OK, realizing there was no power in a cardinalship, he resigned. He murdered his older brother, Giovanni, in 1497, and Cesare assumed his role as captain of the general of military forces 
of the papacy. So what he did was he killed his brother because his brother was running the military. He was like, man, his brother got, my, my brother got power. I don't have any power. I'm just a, a lowly cardinal, you know, guiding the sheep. So he said to himself, hmm, if I kill my brother, then I can take over his job. He ain't trying to know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot better ways to try to get the job, but I guess he thought killing him would have been the easiest way. So he was successful in doing that. He killed his brother. It's well documented. Killed his brother. That's what the title of this whole, this whole thing is. This guy kills his brother. He quickly launched a military campaign to conquer all of Italy. What does that mean? What would a Pope's military be doing conquering other countries? They're bringing the gospel. Just like when America says we're going to bring democracy to your country, you better run and hide because when they get done bringing democracy, there's going to be nothing left but dust and destruction and death. Every country that America goes to to bring uh, democracy is completely destroyed and the men and women and women and children are blown up and killed and murdered right, by the millions. We know this is a fact. Same thing with the papacy. When they tell you they're coming to your country to bring Jesus and the Holy Bible with them and the gospel, the good news. What they mean is they're coming to kill you and destroy you and then subjugate your offspring and make them speak your, their language and make them worship their God. That's exactly what it means. He quickly launched a military campaign to conquer all of Italy. During his brutal reign as captain general, he influenced depictions of Jesus to resemble his own likeness. He said, man, this Jesus here, this guy's got a little bit of power over these people. I want his power too. You see, this guy's an energy vampire. He's an energy vampire. He says, I want that power. This military is not enough. I'm killing a lot of people, but you know what? I want more power than this. I want to be in the people's minds. Every time they think about something I want to pray to or think about holy, I want them to be looking at me. So he says, you know what? Hmm. I'm going to get Leonardo da Vinci to create this for me. So he got Leonardo da Vinci to uh, and assigned him to paint the Christ on a model of Caesar Borgia. And that imprint and that first one became the model for all Jesus Christ images moving forward in time. This is how you can time travel. This guy time traveled with one conscious thought by ordering uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci to paint his image as the image of Christ and make it known that this from him, from hence, from this day forward, I am the Christ. This is the Christ. What he did was he traveled in time into the future. He created a ripple in space time that traveled into the future. And right now, your mom and your dad and your grandparents and some of you listening right now, drop into your knees praying to this evil dude. Don't even know it. The Borgia family is known for incest, intrigue, and murder. He had sex with his sister, Lucrezia. This is his sister, Lucrezia. You may notice her if you play video games. There's a video game. I forget the name of the, oh, uh, Creed. The movie, the, the, the video game called Creed, something Creed. You have uh, Caesar Borgia and his sister, Lucrezia, in the video game, kissing. So they, they, you know, they've encoded it into the video games. So the Borgia family is known for incest, intrigue, and murder. And stories, I spelled that wrong, stories have been told of them since they themselves walked the hallways of the apostolic palace. In particular, vicious rumors and slanderous tales have stuck to the names of the two members of the infamous Borgia family, Cesare and Lucrezia, brother and sister of the histories of history's most notorious family. Okay? There's books about this that you can buy and read. Just look them up on Amazon. Just type in their names on Amazon. These books pop right up. You can look at all the history, all the detailed history for yourself. So this brings me into the next thing here. Well, if that ain't, if he's not Jesus, then who is Jesus? Let's have a look. Zeus, in ancient Greek religion, is the chief deity of the Pantheon, a sky and weather god who was identical with the Roman god Jupiter. His name may be related to that of the sky god Dias of the ancient Hindu Rigveda. Zeus and uh, Zeus was regarded as the sender of thunder and lightning, rain and winds, and his traditional weapon was the thunderbolt, which is he's holding in his hand here, the depiction of him with a thunderbolt. He was called the father, i.e. the ruler and protector of both gods and men. 
As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why um, Alexander the Great felt he had the right to go and take over the world is because he said that he was the offspring. His father wasn't a human, but his father was actually Zeus. And then he was told that he was half human and half uh, Anunnaki because Zeus was actually the Anunnaki named in Lil, which we'll go into. And uh, in the account of uh, Alexander the Great, which is a whole other podcast to talk about, as he went into countries to take over and destroy and subjugate the people to his new system, there would be UFOs flying overhead, helping him to win these battles. And this is in his own accord, his own record, his own account, not a made up account by Billy Carson, an historical account that anybody can look up. And it has something to do with this guy. So Zeus, big time, big name, Zeus. Hmm. Keep that in mind. According to a, uh, a Cretan myth that was later adopted by the Greeks, Cronus, king of the Titans, upon learning that one of his children was fated to dethrone him, swallowed his children as soon as they were born. But Rhea, his wife, saved the infant Zeus by substituting a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes for a Cronus to swallow and hiding Zeus in the cave on Crete. Sounds like the Moses story, doesn't it? There he was nursed by the nymph, uh, Amalthea, and guarded by the Curites, which were, who were young warriors, who clashed their weapons to disguise the baby's cries. After Zeus grew to manhood, he led a revolt against Titans and succeeded in dethroning Cronus, perhaps with the assistance of his brothers Hades and Poseidon, with whom he then divided dominion over the world. Sounds like a myth, but there's a lot of truth in this story. The story is uh, part myth, part truth. And this guy, this entity, this being, Zeus, was actually a real person. If you go back into the Babylonian cuneiform Sumerian tablets, you discover that Zeus is actually Enlil. Enlil is Zeus in Babylonian. This is thousands of years prior to the Greeks even having this guy show up. Poseidon, a.k.a. Neptune, Lord of the sea, wheels the trident. When angered, he can cause earthquakes and turbulent waters. And when uh, appropriated properly, he can prevent or calm the same. He is associated with the horses and bulls as well. Okay. Always have, we always hear talk in the ancient text about the bull of heaven. They're talking about Enlil. This guy was evil. Enlil was so evil. When you look into the ancient Sumerian tablets, you find that when humans were populating the earth at a high speed, which he liked because he needed them as slaves. When they got too noisy, he would order them. This is carved in stone, guys. He would order them to be slaughtered in mass. Just call them, call them, call the humans. They're too noisy. Kill them off. He would put a chemical on their crops to dry the crops out so they would, wouldn't be able to harvest and would starve to death. That way he can keep control of the, um, of the population, population control. He would spray something in the air over their cities to kill massive amounts of them at a time. Sounds like chemtrails in ancient times. Chemtrails ain't new. They were already doing this. This is Zeus. And why am I talking about this guy? Zeus, a.k.a. Enlil in ancient texts, because Enlil was also the god of Genesis that came into the garden and noticed that uh, Adam and Eve had put clothes on and they had, were aware of, consciously aware of who they were and that they weren't animals, that they were really sentient beings. And he was pissed off about that. In the ancient text, he's known as Satan, the Lord of Eden. This guy is Satan, the devil himself. OK, but he pretends to be a God. and He calls himself Yahweh in the modern day Bible. But let's dig a little deeper into this. So uh, Zeus, why am I bringing this up? Let's look a little deeper into some more of this ancient text. Here goes another depiction of him. You see him holding the same type of object in his hand here. This is even uh, older. Isus, the Celtic lord or master, powerful Celtic deity, one of three mentioned by the Roman poet Lucan in the first century AD. The other two were uh, Tyrannus, which is thunderer, and Tuketes, which is god of the people. This is your Holy Trinity. This, this is where the Holy Trinity actually originated from. This is where your Holy Trinity originated from. I, I shouldn't say originated. It's one of the Holy Trinities that this version of it made it into the biblical text. 
Isus has had he had victims. This guy was pretty brutal because we're talking about the same guy that I just told you about, Zeus, aka and Lil. Isus victims, according uh, according to later co uh, commentators, were sacrificed by being ritually stabbed and hung from trees. Hung from trees sound like the slavery times to me. Sound like the same thing that happened for the last four hundred years in America. Hung from trees. Uh, hung from trees. A relief of the uh, from the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris portrays him as a bent woodman cutting a branch from a willow tree. That's mm, interesting. It always has the same exact form. This is related in relief to uh, Trier Gur associated with him, the sacred bull, and his accompanying cranes or egrets. Human victims were sacrificed to Isus by being tied to a tree and flogged to death. And so this is the guy that uh, name much later evolved into Jesus. So this is why I'm taking you on this on this trail. Isus, Celtic Lord, Lord, your Lord God or master, which he's also been known as a powerful deity, right, who comes with his own trinity. And is brutal, a brutal killing murderer. And so that is not actually Jesus that you think of. Again, you've been praying to and calling on and and using the word cymatic frequency. Words are cymatic frequencies. When you utter them, you create vibrations in space time that alter the, your reality in this dimension. And so every time you call on the name of Jesus, you're calling on Enlil, Zeus, a.k.a. Isus. You're calling on a brutal murdering killer. And you're also then looking at the face of a guy who was also a brutal, brutal murderer, killer, incest, uh, power hungry dude. And these are the people that you inadvertently are calling on and praying to. The Greek savior Zeus in time became the word Isus, which was further corrupted into Jesus in English. Yeah, let me say that again to you guys. The Greeks savior was Zeus. That was their savior. They prayed to Zeus. The word Isus, see, J didn't exist yet. J didn't exist until 1524. So if I go back to the story of Caesar Borgia, you'll find out he was in the 1400s when he ordered Leonardo da Vinci to, uh, to do his image, create him in the image of Jesus. The name wasn't Jesus. It was Isus without a J. Guess why, guys? Because the J didn't even exist yet. J didn't exist and wasn't pronounced until 1524. How did Jay get a sound? Both I and J were used interchangeably by scribes to express the sound of both the vowel and the consonant. It wasn't until 1524 when G Gian Giorgio Tresino, an Italian Renaissance grammarian known as the father of the letter J, made a clear distinction between the two sounds. And then J was precariously added to Isus, changing it to Jesus, evolving over time into Jesus. So what does it mean when you say Jesus, you're saying hail Zeus. That's what you're saying. You're saying hail to Zeus. And there will be Bible study websites that will try to deny this on Google. They'll try to deny that. They're, no, that's not what it means and blah, blah, blah. But when you dig deep into the text and you dig deep into real ancient history and go and get the real ancient books and get the Greek books out and get the Latin books out. All of a sudden you go, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, we've been saying hail Zeus this whole damn time. People have just turned around, Jesus! And they're calling on Zeus. They're calling on Zeus, and in their mind, they got an image of this white guy who was a killer and an ancestor. <laughs> and, 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 and at the same time, the entity, Zeus himself, is one of the most brutal, killing, murdering slave owners in the world, in the history of the world. This is why... This, this religion has got to come to an end because it's a farce. It's an absolute farce. Now, Yeshua was the name of Jesus. His name was the person they're trying to attribute that fake name to is actually Yeshua, which means Joshua in English, but Yeshua in Middle East, right? This These images are not images that I pulled out. This particular image of Yeshua it comes from Egypt. 
from the church, the Coptic church in Egypt. Coptic churches existed long before Christianity even existed. And this is the image of Yeshua from uh, the Coptic church. On the right, you see Ethiopian Jews. And you see the Ethiopian Jews have been here for a very, 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 very long time. And you see that these men are actually black men. Now, what does this mean? Does it matter? Is this, is this video about race and color? Actually, it isn't. It's not. It's about education. I want you to know something. I want you to learn something today because you have to understand the foolishness that's been going on on this planet for a couple thousand years, even more than that, but at least for a couple thousand years in, in regards to Yeshua and, uh, and, what's, and what, and what um, dogma has been placed on all of our generations of children down the pipeline which is, which is ridiculously altering the way that we live on this planet and how we think, breathe, eat, sleep, and everything else. So Yeshua is a Middle Eastern man, was a Middle Eastern man, and I do mean man. He was a Middle Eastern man with ties to people that weren't human and they weren't gods either. They were just advanced beings. It was interesting about Yeshua. He was a virgin birth, according to the biblical text. But if you look into some of the older apocrypha texts, you discover that Yeshua's grandmother, Yeshua's grandmother, Mary's mother, was also a virgin birth. We have evidence of in vitro fertilization in ancient times to create a specific line that this guy comes out of, Yeshua. Was he a real person that existed? Yeah, because I've been to the house that he lived in, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute when he was a kid. The Ethiopian Jews is interesting as they have the Torah, they have everything. Jews have lived in Ethiopia for over 2,000 years. It's really closer to 5,000 years, to be honest with you. According to the Ethiopian tradition, one half of the population of the Jewish before Christianity was proclaimed the official religion in the fourth century. The Jews maintained their independence for over 1,000 years in spite of continuous massacres, religious persecution, enslavement, and forced conversions. With the help of modern Portuguese weapons, the Amhara finally conquered the Jews in 1616, enslaving, converting, and killing them, known as falsas, and derog a derogatory name, which meaning stranger or exile. Ethiopian Jews could no longer own land or be educated. Today, Jews number in only 25,000, less of one percent, less than one percent of the population. 85% live in Gondar province, in the Semian Mountains near Lake Tana. The rest live in Tigre and Wolo provinces. Ethiopian Jews are biblical pre-Rabbanic Jews. Pre-Rabbanic. That means before rabbis existed, they existed. Before rabbis existed, these black Jews already were here. They have the Torah, which is the written law. The Torah came from Ethiopia and then made its way into Europe when the uh, Ashkenazi Jews got their hands on it and the Khazarians. All right. But not the Talmud, which is the oral law. Their language is not Hebrew, but Giz. Their leaders are priests known as Kohanim, rather than rabbis. They, the interpretation of the law, e.g. the prohibition against mixing meat and milk. Until recently, Ethiopian Jews practiced animal sacrifice and ritual purification through immersion in water. Otherwise, their religion is the same as Judaism throughout the world including the observance of the Sabbath and biblical uh, dietary laws. They are religious Zionists. They dream of their re a return to Zion. They call themselves Beta Israel, House of Israel, and have wanted to live in the modern state of Israel since its establishment in 1948. But they're banned from living there because they're black. So they went off and created this white uh, Jewish uh, country this Zion and and left and the black people that they got the information from on how to live this way, which I still think is not the way for a human being to live. I think that there's a much better way than this these religious dogma. But however, put them, ban them from coming here to live there. You, know, you guys stay up here in that little mountain area where you will be, where we, you know, we almost killed you off. You guys just stay over there. And so that's where where all that comes from. Jesus wasn't uh, a Christian. Okay. Jesus was not a Christian. Christianity didn't exist until Jesus was long gone and dead. But the practice of understanding a Christ, 
a Christ consciousness existed and understanding what it meant to ascend to a higher level of consciousness, they called it Christ consciousness. It's an ancient text in deep antiquity. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Jesus, or really his name is Yeshua, is just one of many teachers of Christ's knowledge and wisdom. Okay? This image here is from Egypt. It's from the, um, the Coptic Museum. Okay? This is from the Coptic Museum. This is a very, very old image of Yeshua. Not Asus, not Hail Zeus, but Yeshua, okay, uh, giving a lesson and talking to people, possibly his disciples on the right, and and uh, and possibly uh, people that he's speaking to on the left, right, or, or vice versa, depending on which angle you're looking at this. However, what's interesting is this man did teach some amazing things, and he learned some amazing things. When he disappeared out of the Bible at the age of twelve, he went to Egypt. Okay, that's where he went. He went to Egypt. This is where he went. This is where he lived right here in, in this room. You're looking at the actual room, which is now a shrine. Anyone going to Egypt with me this October, I will be taking you here. I think we have 65 or 70 people coming with me and we'll be taking pictures in here. If you look on that back wall, you can see Yeshua underneath the candle there. This is a shrine now. He actually lived, slept, ate in this area right here, which has now been turned into a Coptic church. They built up on the around it. it used to be like considered like a it was like a cave here. It was like a, 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 a sheltered a, a cave made into a shelter. Now it's an actual um, Coptic church. And you can come in the front door and walk down to this crypt that's there as a as a um, uh, you know, as being preserved in, re in recognition or re memory of Yeshua. Um, his mother was here as well. Mary. Right. What did he do here? He came here to learn the Egyptian mysteries. From who? Thoth. Thoth, the Atlantean priest king who ruled over the land of Kem for 14,000 years. That's not Billy telling you this. That's the Egyptian hieroglyphs telling you this. It's not all coming off the top of my head. That's the Egyptian hieroglyphs telling you this, the language of light. And so... Then he leaves out of here as he gets a little bit older and he goes on a journey to Tibet, which has been confirmed by the Dalai Lama. I had a whole video about this with uh, Robert Grant. He went to Tibet, well account, well known account of him in Tibet, learning Reiki healing, Qigong, healing with the hands, energy moving through the body, meditation, all of that. After he became a master of that, he headed down into India where he learned the mystic arts and reincarnation. And then he taught reincarnation all the way back down into Egypt. Then the Bible picks up and says, I call him when he's 32, I called my son out of Egypt. That's where the Bible picks up. I called my son out of Egypt. And so then he, he returns to Jerusalem coming in on the back of a donkey, right? That's where it picks up. That's the next scene. So, but this exists. And this is a well-known account that the records are clear. The evidence is clear. This is where he actually lived and walked and lived among people every single day as the boy grew into a man, not a God. We are all God. And he tried to tell you all that. He tried to tell you, ye are gods. We are all God walking in the flesh. We're a fractal of the universal consciousness that, that is the energy that creates this entire universe. Every single one of us is God. So anyway, this is where Yeshua actually lived. And so what does this come down to? Time walks through men, but gods walk through time. And we have to understand that we are in a state of the world right now. Let me stop sharing this. We're in a state of the world right now where we need to understand who we are, where we came from, and we need to also accept uh, a lot of the things that we did do in the past that were wrong. Uh, and, and so a lot of people get, get real happy when they hear, oh, man, yeah, you know, we were all, Jesus was black. And, well, to be honest with you, there were a lot of black people in, in, the, in, the, in this area. Africa extended far past where it is now. That, that, you can't go by the invisible lines that people put on 
continents and it extended all the way up until what we call the Middle Eastern area. But if you look at a lot of these biblical texts and tales, you find that people enslaved people. Hebrews enslaved other Hebrews had their own slaves. I'm against slavery of any type. I'm against slavery of any race of people. I'm against slavery, period. I'm against if an animal knew how to enslave another animal, I'm against that. I'm against slavery, period. So when you own the when you try to own up to, you know, all this. Yeah, yeah, it was us. Well, own up to all of it, too. <clears throat> own up to the slavery. Own up to the brutal murderings of women. Own up to the brutal rape of women. Own up to all of it. Own up to all of it. So the thing is to not get excited about what color, what skin color somebody was. The thing is to get excited about learning the truth about the ancient past and saying, wow, this whole time we've been praying to this, uh, this, uh, Pope. And then at the same time, we're praying to this Pope. This image is burnt into our literally burnt into our brain to the point where when you hear Jesus, you instantly see that face. So we're, we're, we're we, this, this guy is taking up real estate in all the brains of 8 billion people on planet Earth. And at the same time that you see that face, you're calling a name that has nothing to do with that face. It's got a tie back to an ancient Anunnaki being named Enlil. That was a brutal enslaving murderer on this planet and put in the systems in place that we still have today, including the police system, the bicameral Congress. All that was started by Enlil. Even he, he even started the way that uh, city grids are laid out. He said to his sister in one of the tablets to Ninma, he said to Ninma, this plan I have on this planet is to last for all time. This guy didn't say this should last for a couple hundred years. This guy said, my plan for what I'm going to do to this planet is going to last for all time. That's etched in stone. And guess what, guys? The evidence of that is still all around us. Because no matter what neighborhood I go to, there's a thousand churches in every neighborhood. And the more brutal the neighborhood is, if I go to my I went to my old neighborhood actually about three months ago, took Elizabeth down there. There were, I think it was 32 churches in a eight square mile area. And 32 in that area, in that neighborhood, people are getting shot and killed, stabbed and drugged out and dying from overdoses and houses broken into. The crime is through the roof every single day. My elementary school has a 20 foot barbed wire fence around it. And there's a church right around the next corner. You see what I'm saying? What's going on here? You need to understand that these images that they put out, this programming that they put out is fake. They want you to believe that this Yeshua was sent here from heaven by some magical white deity with a white robe on and a magic wand. And then the guy with the magic wand and the white robe said, you know what? These people, I know I'm omnipotent and I'm omniscient and I know everything, but I just can't seem to figure out how to make these people behave. So what I'll do is I'll sacrifice, I'll kill my own son and that'll teach him. <laughs> Come on, man. For real. That, that will be, that's what, that's what we, and then we read, and then we're in school, we told that the Greeks have mythology and then people go to Bible study the same night. Uh, come on. For real. Are we, are we being for real here? Come on guys. We got to stop. <laughs> we got to stop, man. We got to stop this foolishness. At some point, we got to sit down and say, something ain't really adding up here. Um, Yeah, this is contradicting this. This is contradicting that. Uh, God knows everything, but yet he didn't know that Adam and Eve became conscious. God knows everything, but at the same time, he couldn't stop people from being bad. He couldn't just come down and say, hey, guys, I have a better way to teach you something. Let me show you something a little bit different. He couldn't just figure it out. So he said, you know what? I got something. I'll just torture my own kid, my own kid. And then that'll teach him. Listen, in the Sinai Bible, which predates the King James Bible. Yeshua was never sacrificed. Let me say that again. In the Sinai Bible which predates the King James Bible. 
by almost a thousand years, Yeshua was never sacrificed. Not only that, there's close to 10,000 mistranslations between the two Bibles. The King James Bible is heavily, 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 heavily curated information. You want to get closer to the source, you got to get to the Ethiopian Bible, which includes the, the, the book of Enoch. That's the only Bible in the world that includes the book of the full book of Enoch is in the Ethiopian Bible. And uh, this book has been so altered and so played with that the information is skewed and set up in a way with pure neuroscience. And when I mean whoever these people that put this together. These people had to be neuroscientists. This is why I'm telling you in my previous video from last week. Could the God of the Bible really be Satan? Well, the answer is yes. And the answer is this is the person and him and his other, his nephew, Amin Ra, curated this thing from the very beginning, how they wanted it to play out. So they can make you think that they were going to their demise. Meanwhile, they were leading you to your own demise. Taking you completely off course and off track as to what the real meaning of the text actually is. By mixing a lot of truth with a little bit of lies, sprinkling it right in there with some fabrication. Now, you as a human being with a regular old standard IQ of about 80 can't even detect it. And then now you're thinking, oh, we outwitted this devil. We outwitted this dude. He's dumb. No, this guy is supposed to be had the highest IQ next to God. According to your book, his IQ was right up there with God's IQ. So his IQ was in the thousands. And your IQ is 80, and you're telling me you're following this book that says he's going to go into this lake of fire. Step by step to his own destruction is laid all out for him. He's just going to follow it. And you believe that? And your IQ is 80, and his IQ is over in the thousands. Come on now. Either you got to come to some uh, understanding that maybe this guy is, is IQ ain't in the thousands. Maybe this guy it doesn't even exist. Heaven and hell is a state of mind. Hell was added to the Bible by the Roman Catholic Church. Lake of Fire was added to the Bible in the 1600s, Roman Catholic Church. The uh, rapture was added to the Bible in 1835 by William James Darby. Okay, added to the Bible. Then later became, it was a cliff note originally, a suggestion that he came up with on his own. But when some pastors had saw how much power it had over the people, it later made it into the canonized text. And now you got people running around talking about the Lord is coming to rapture me and take me back on this cloud and all this crazy stuff. No, ma'am. No, sir. That's just fabrication, fabricated information that you didn't know about. Doesn't exist. Heaven is here and hell is here. They're both in the same location. And what is your job and mission on this earth, according to what I read in the Bible, from what I understand to be factual information? Your mission is to bring heaven to earth. Your mission is to create a divine outlook on what you think life is supposed to be and what it should look like and how people should love one another and how we should be all prosperous and how we can utilize our knowledge and wisdom and combine that with our technology and everything else that we've learned and love for animals and everything else. And then how we can then project that consciously from a multi-dimensional platform of thought into a three-dimensional reality. That's what this is all about. That's what heaven is. And right now, until we figure it out, we're in hell. See, the, when they had the slave times and they came over with the biblical text and they kept telling you guys, you got to die to get to heaven. Meanwhile, the same people that was telling you, you got to die to get to heaven, they was creating their own heaven on earth. By making you the slave <laughs> and living life the way that they wanted to. Your mission is to create heaven on earth. Stop going after all these fake deities. Stop chasing after Jesus. Stop chasing after all these names and all these images that you see. The, 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 when you finally wake up and realize that when you close your eyes and you hear a voice, people say, oh, God told me this and God told me that. I say to them, well, what, 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 what did he sound like? What, what is, because you keep saying he, well, what is he, what does he sound like? Oh, he's got this voice and I just know this voice. Really? Okay. It's a man's voice. Yeah. It's a man's voice. It's a, he's, he's our, he's our father. Really? A father. Okay. So you've given a gender to a deity. That's really interesting. That's a double compounded issue. 
Now, when you are hearing this voice, what is it? What is it telling you to do? It's telling me to do this and tell, it's giving me information. What these people don't realize is the voice that they're hearing in their head is their own voice talking to their own self. When you reach a higher level of consciousness, that voice, it starts to change. It don't stay the same. When you start off in a religious mind, it sounds like some outside, deep, echoing, bellowing voice giving you commands. As you become more and more conscious, the voice morphs. And then the next thing you know, it's your own voice. And when you get to the point that you hear your own voice in your own head talking to you, because remember, you're not here. That's when you've began to ascend to a higher level. That's the beginning of getting to the next level. That's the beginning. Because the brain does not create consciousness. I'm going to say that again. The brain does not create consciousness. It downloads consciousness. Your consciousness is streaming from a higher source and coming in here. And your body, your avatar body, is designed to encapsulate a specific, a particular frequency of that source. So you have a radio station in your neighborhood that has multiple stations, but it's only one location. But it's sending out 99.1, 99.2, 99.3, 99.4. Those 0.1 dots, that's every single person that exists in the entire universe. Each one of us in the entire universe is a point dot whatever number coming from one source, slightly tuned different frequency. Your avatar body is designed to encapsulate a specific frequency. It picks it up. You animate the avatar body and you inhabit it for a temporal amount of time. Temporal meaning time, time based will be considered to be time in the third dimension. It's temporary. Once the avatar body is depleted. It releases that universal consciousness, that energy, that spiritual energy back up into source. And based on what happens there, you come back again. Or you can send to higher dimensions, as Thoth talks about in the Emerald Tablets. It's based on how many lessons you have learned in different lifetimes. How much have you acquired? How much knowledge and wisdom have you acquired? And how not only have you acquired it, but how have you executed that knowledge and that wisdom? Have you acted on it? Because I can have all the knowledge and wisdom in the world. I'll give you an example. And starting in 1977, I started researching aerospace technology because I saw something in my backyard that didn't make any sense to me. It didn't look like an airplane. And I, I, even as a kid, I knew that what I saw wasn't an airplane. I started looking in all the Encyclopedia Britannica, the original old fashioned, the, the ancient Google, okay, reading books to get the information. I researched swept wing, delta wing. I researched supersonic transport. I researched ballistics. I went into everything. I couldn't find what I was looking for. I said, man, what the hell did I just see? And I kept researching and researching. And then it led me into other areas of research and study. And between 1977 and, uh, and 2008, maybe 2000, almost into 2009, between that period of time, I had acquired so much knowledge that my head was gonna explode and I couldn't do anything with it. I had nobody to talk to, I had nobody to share it with, I had nothing behind it that I can execute with it to help change people, the world or anything like that. I was sitting around waiting for the web to get here because I had read that the Hopis said that the world would be connected by a web, an information web, and that information will be able to pass from place to place instantaneously. And so I was just standing by waiting on time to catch up with my knowledge. But during that time period when I couldn't do anything, pretty much just little things here and there, nothing major. All that knowledge is just going to waste. You're just sitting in one place doing absolutely nothing until I had the ability to execute it and to use it and to put it out and to uh, um, uh, to take fractals of it and spread it amongst people and become a teacher. Right. You can have all the information in the world, but if you can't use it, if you can't do anything with it then it's a waste. So you have to learn how to execute knowledge. You have to learn how to gain knowledge and then actually utilize it. Knowledge is not power, but the execution of knowledge is actually power. That's where real power comes in. This is how the elites operate, how the oligarchs operate, how these biblical religious figures that masqueraded as God, how they operated. 
they utilized knowledge in a way that they executed the knowledge. They didn't just gain the wisdom and knowledge. They actually put energy behind it and executed it. And that gave them actual power. And so people often ask me when I have these talks, do I believe that God exists? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because if you study quantum physics, you discover that we're living in a creation. Now, it's an intelligent design down to every little tiny atom, even beyond atoms into quarks, even if you can go beyond that. So what does that mean? Well, that means that something or someone created this. It's not an accident. And if it's not an accident, then the op, then the figure that we call that we would call God or the creator of the universe, in my opinion, actually exists. What I'm telling you is what you the dogma that you've been chasing and your generations of family members have been chasing for eons after these fake images have destroyed humanity are responsible for more people have died from religious belief more than any reason on the planet of the face of, the, of the planet Earth. More people have died from religious beliefs than anything else. When the papal inquisitions happened, 80 million people tortured and killed. That makes Hitler look like an angel compared to these people. And then they want to tell you that, oh, the gospel was spread all around the world by love and joy. No, that's not how it got spread around the world. They come to your country. They get the indigenous chief or the Bushman or whatever. They torture him and kill him and burn him right in front of everybody in the village and say, now you learn our language and you pray to our God. And then you pay your taxes. OK, next. Let's go to the next place and do it again. And the next place and do it again until it got spread around the world. Let's rape the women, rape the children like I taught you guys last week from the biblical text. So what I'm telling you is the stuff that you're chasing in that book is not what you think it is. A majority of it is from people. And I do mean plural people, not singular, because if you look at the ancient text where the word God comes in the Bible, it's actually gods with an S, plural, which was then accidentally on purpose mistranslated into the biblical canonized books. It's actually two different people. Uh, in that book, in that Bible, not one. It's actually two people, not creators of universes, but actual flesh and blood people that put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you and me. And unfortunately, they've been able to literally hoodwink an entire planet with this foolishness. And then you got the other people that come along behind them and realize, shoot, there's power in this. This guy... Caesar Borgia said, man, this guy got the, this image of Jesus got power. I'm changing it to my face. From this point forward, everybody's going to think it's me. They're going to pray to me. I'm, I'm going to absorb all this prayer energy every single day. When trillions of people start praying, I want it all coming to me. And then you got the people calling on Zeus every single day, still to this current. You got all these preachers and all these pastors running around, jumping around, sweating like crazy. I can make you jump around and sweat and cry like crazy. I can make you talk in tongues. All I got to do is find the right, right frequency on my beat machine and, 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 my, and my piano and my, my guitar. I know how to build up and drop a frequency that'll make you jump for joy. Michael Jackson had the power. He'd have people crying and dancing and jumping and passing out at the concerts. A good rock and roll song will make you do the same exact thing. Do you fool yourself into believing something that's, that's not even happening? You psych yourself out. You psych your avatar body out. Last week, I talked about praying. I talked about uh, what's going on in the Bible with a lot of these texts. If you can watch last week's video, you're going to learn a lot. But you got to watch with an open mind and open heart. You got to realize I'm not here to browbeat you. I'm here to tell you, hey, it's time to wake up. We in a coma out here, a pure coma. We're not sleeping. We beyond. So you got sleep and then you got coma. It's time to come out of this coma, guys, and start living. This this religious dogma has put us in a coma and has us walking around like zombies in the afterworld. OK, and it's time to change that. You don't need to call on Zeus and have the image of this pope killer in order to be a loving person. You don't need to call on Zeus and have the image of this, uh, you know, this killing pope named Caesar to, to be one to give, to give do, do faith, good works and faith for others and, and help others and, 
and, and do good works and, and donate things and help people out. You don't need it. You don't need them for that. You don't need them outside sources in order to empower yourself and do things for yourself and save yourself. Like I told you, I'm going to wrap this up with this. When I was a little kid living in Opelika in Miami, Florida, piss poor broke with holes in my shoes and, and, and rips in my crotch because I was growing so fast. Right. Two pairs of pants, no food, no money, eating matzah crackers. Speaking of Jews, I used to eat matzah crackers and butter. And we also sometimes would have Cairo syrup, which is that clear syrup on, t- on top of toast. And eat that. That'll be sometimes lunch and dinner. Sometimes a crossing guard going to Rainbow Park Elementary would jack us. So in the morning, you'd lose your lunch or your money. You go to school with about 75 cents for lunch, you get jacked. You go to school with a bag of lunch so they wouldn't take the money, they take your food anyway because they're hungry too. The crossing guards would take your money. One day I decided I was going to, I needed money for the ice cream truck. I got tired of not being able to buy the ice cream for the ice cream truck. I just wanted to buy the bubble gum actually, not the ice cream. I, don't, I didn't like the ice cream that much. The bazooka bubble gum with the cartoons inside of it, the little comic strips inside. And I decided I was going to take my toys and go door to door and sell them door to door in my neighborhood, asking for donate donations. And I went against my own mother on this because my mother, who didn't know I was going to do that, number one. Number two, I had a parameter. So the house we had in the ghetto, we had this little fence and I couldn't go past this gate and that part of the gate. If I passed that those two parts of the gate, I was in big trouble unless my mother was out there with us. I said, look. I'm going to have to get in trouble. I went door to door. Bam, bam, bam. Ma'am, sir, a penny, a dollar, a nickel, a quarter, a dime, whatever you have. I just want to, I'm looking for donations for my toys. I got rid of all my toys that day and I had money in my hands. And that's when it dawned on me. I'm here to save myself. From that moment, I knew what was going on is that I was going to be the one to save myself by action, by putting action behind conscious thought would get me out of this situation and change my life. And that's exactly what I set upon doing. Fortunately for me, as a as what we people would call a kid, my brain was more mature. And I understood that at an early age. And I set myself goals and a whole trajectory to get myself out of that situation and out of, and out of that hood. And by the time I was 16, I already had moved out, had two cars, my own place, running my company, and still graduated from school. You see? I'm my own savior. I'm not sitting around waiting for some outside deity. I'm not going to beg some outside sources to come and save me. That's low frequency. Begging and pleading and hoping and whining. That's low frequency. Calling on Enlil from the Bible and, and, and the Sumerian tablets. Zeus. Calling on, uh, and if you think you can call on Yeshua, you're just calling on a man. He told you the power is within you. And the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. He talking, he's saying, hey, man, he's saying the same thing I'm telling you guys. Hey, man, it's all on you now. You got to come and you got to do. He said, you got to do better works than me. That's what the Bible said. So all these people running around, these Christians running around, begging and pleading for all this stuff to happen. But the Bible said you're supposed to do better than him. What he did, you're supposed to do greater works. So where's your why are you not living in your power? Why are you not living in your power? You've been robbed of that power by dogma. That's why you've been robbed of it. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here to wake you up. All right. Anyway, guys, look, I love you. You got to do some research. If you're basing your eternity on one book and one book only, and you don't know 99% of the stuff I know, you got a serious problem. <laughs> you're going to be back again. Reincarn- Just like a video game. When you play the video game and you, and you die in the video game, you come back again for another life. You come back over and over until you reach the top level, right? That's what's happening right here. You don't even see it. You can't feel it. You can't understand it. What's, what's, un, what's going on in this realm is some people that are here, regardless of what their physical age is in the third dimension, they're ancient. There are people here walking these streets right now that are ancient. A 20-year-old could be an ancient entity, ancient person, have been here many, many, many times. And then you have people here most of the people, in my opinion, that are wrapped up in this dogma. These are newborn babies. This is your first or second time here. That's why you're caught up in in, um, in what I would like to call this uh, you know, young-minded uh, thinking and this very immature thinking and belief system that exists called religion uh, and, and really becoming a fanatic of dogma. 
Uh, and that's something that younger people in terms of their universal age are susceptible to. So I'm not mad at you. I'm not angry at you. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just trying to make things a little shocking. And by making things shocking, people pay attention. When you do things, oh, you know, I just want you to know that the information, when you do that, mm, the results aren't as strong. <laughs> and me understanding applied neuroscience, which is what I went to MIT for, I understand that sometimes you need shock factor. And so I use a shock factor approach, but it's not to hurt or injure or make anybody feel sad. It's about shocking a certain number of people. I know that my technique will reach a certain number of people in a way that nothing else will reach them. And that's why I use these techniques. It's all about the technique and how to wake people up in a way that will make them begin to want to ask questions to their own self first and then begin to research information. All right. Anyway, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Somebody said, how do you expect to learn from your memories? You see, one of the tricks, I'll answer this one question by this guy and, and I got to get out of here. When you look at uh, coming back and having full memory, it takes time to acquire a certain level of knowledge and wisdom and understanding spiritually and consciously in the third dimension. And so when you analyze that, you realize that the people that genetically modify us by um, fusing chromosome number two and pulling telomere caps on it, shortening our lifespan. That's what happened in the Tower of Babel incident. Human beings used to live for thousands of years. Thousands. Okay. In the Sumerian Kings list, which I'll be at in uh, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going live from there and I'll be showing you the Sumerian Kings list live. There's people on there that ruled for 14,400 years, 28,000 years. One person, right? Uh, you, you'll see a, a few men ruled, with, uh, with the exception of a woman, ruled for over 200,000 years on Earth. These lifespans were immense, immense lifespans. Well, what happened? At the Tower of Babel incident, our lifespans were shortened. That's a whole other podcast to talk about. I've talked about this a few times. You can find them on my, in my videos. But scientists now confirm it happened. Our telomeres were capped, reducing our lifespan to 120 years max. OK, when you shorten your lifespan, when, you, when they shorten our lifespan, it was so that we wouldn't gain knowledge and wisdom. Because over time, you become more and more wise. The older you get, you become more and more wise. You begin to see things differently. You begin to change. Just like when you're a young teenager, you do a lot of risky things. And as you get into, turn into a young man or a young woman, you begin to get a little bit more cautious as you have more responsibility, but you sometimes, even at those ages, you're still kind of out there, you know, um, doing your thing. And then by the time you turn 35, 40, all of a sudden you slow down a way a lot. You like your whole idea of reality and perception of reality and life changes and you move into a whole nother mode and phase of life. Now imagine multiplying that over a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years where you would get consciously then you ascend towards such a high level of consciousness that Thoth talks about in my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, in where you can learn how to even incarnate at will. And not only incarnate at will, but he even says on and in the plane you desire. In other words, even in different dimensions. They were like, we can't let this many billions of people do this. How can we, how can we keep them um, locked consciously into a prison? Oh, we shorten their lifespan. They'll never get, they'll never get wise. And then they'll stuck, be stuck reincarnating before they get enough knowledge and wisdom to ascend to a higher level. So it takes a lot of practice, work, determination. Now, in the 75, 80 years you do have, if you're even blessed to live that long anymore, to divulge and digest and discern as much knowledge and wisdom and information you possibly can so that you can work on ascending and making up for time that you don't have to get the knowledge and the wisdom. Shortening the amount of times you have to reincarnate on this planet. That's what my goal. That's what, my, that's what I'm doing. That's why I do what I do. You see? So it's a whole, that's a whole other podcast to get into, but I'm glad you asked the question. But guys, I appreciate you guys. I love you so much. Thank you for those uh, donations tonight. Please take this video and share it to as many Christian people as you possibly can share it to. They need to start learning what the heck they're praying to, who they're praying to, what they're praying to. They need to understand that the power is within them that they are God walking in the flesh and the same spark that created this entire universe is in every single atom in their own body and that their consciousness is streaming 
from that same God source and inhabiting this avatar body for the purpose of learning what, it, what it's like to be a, a person in the third dimension. What lessons can be learned here? How is it to experience this life in this realm? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And then how do we then take what we know is in a higher dimension, which is heaven, and bring that to earth? Can it be done? This is the big uh, experiment that's going on. Can it be done? Can they rise to that level of a golden age where they can bring heaven to earth? And if they do bring heaven to earth in a golden age, which has been done before, can they sustain it? Can they maintain that level consistently, ongoing, through eternity? Can they then spread out from this planet to others and duplicate this over and over again? Can they harness the power of their sun the proper way? All these are the questions. This is a big experiment. That's exactly what this is. Will they learn unconditional love in a level, and to a level in a way that everyone is 1,000% equal across the board? That when they look at somebody else, the color of their skin doesn't even have an effect on them consciously. It doesn't even have a physiological effect. It doesn't even come across the thought of color, color of skin doesn't even cross their mind. All they see is another one of themselves. In la kek a la kin. That's what the Mayans say. I am another you. All right. Guys, I love you guys. Peace. I'm out. I'll see you again soon. Don't forget, get the Black Knight Satellite documentary, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. 4BK.tv or 4BK.tv. Forbiddenknowledge.tv. All right.